and welcome to season six of All Stars Online. I'm your host, Sierra, and this week we have the 2021 and 2022 World Brewers Cup champion finalist representing the United States of America, Alika Lifty. Hi, everyone, and hi, Sierra. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, Bob. Uh, it feels before... like only weeks ago. Yeah, it feels like literally weeks ago. <laughs> so before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to our sponsors. All Stars Online is supported by season sponsor Barista Attitude. Barista Attitude is the 2022 to 2025 World Barista Championship Qualified Espresso Machine sponsor and proud to support competitors around the world with Tempesta Coffee Machines. Learn more at barista-attitude.com. This episode is also supported by Scotsman Ice. So in this episode, me and Alika are going to be revisiting what went down in Melbourne a few weeks ago at the World Coffee Championships. We're going to be chatting with Alika about his coffee career and competitions, and we also get to see his signature beverage later, so stay tuned for that. So let's get started. Alika, how you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a busy day, busy, you know, couple weeks since uh, since Melbourne, but you know, hitting hitting that grind, so to speak. Did you have to hit the ground running pretty much after you got back from Melbourne? Oh, like, absolutely. Did you get over jet lag at all, or? Yeah, I transitioned pretty well, um, both there and coming back. So, but yeah, I got in. Sunday nights, well, Sunday late afternoon, and I was back in work Monday morning. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> what did anything kind of change for you? You know, when you kind of touched down and went back to work, were people like, "Oh my gosh, congratulations! You placed second this year." You know, what was the what was the response from people on your first day back at work? Honestly, they were less excited this year than they were last year. That's a bummer. It's like, oh, hey, Lika, welcome back. Hey, good job. No, I'm just kidding. It was, a, there was, it, was a, it was a mixed bag. I mean, obviously, like, a lot of congratulations. Um, but uh, I, I work in our in our basement mainly, in our training lab. That's where I'm at right now. And uh, our production crew, uh, it was the, the biggest uh, uh, support, support net when I got home. Great. So you work in the coffee dungeons of a very well-known roastery in the United States. Tell us a little bit about That's where true. you're working at the moment and what you do. Yeah. So I work for Onyx Coffee Lab uh, it, here in Rogers, Arkansas. This is our headquarters. It's where we roast all of our coffee. It's where all of our warehousing and production is. And it is where I currently work, yes, in the dungeon, uh, a.k.a. the um, the headquarter basement. Um yeah, so I have a small training staff here at Onyx, and we uh, bring not only wholesale partners into this lab, but we bring our own baristas and um, you know people for public courses. And so in-house training, and then we go out into our cafes and our wholesale partners and um, follow up in the cafes with new baristas for training, QC our own cafes, uh, most of what I do for QSing is just arguing with the roasters. Um, so, <laughs> I'm sure you speak for all QC people around the world when you say that. <laughs> so, from where you are now doing QC and training, you know, that's a huge journey from where you started. How did you first get into coffee? Mm. Uh, I got into coffee when I was in college, had a roommate. Uh, who worked at a coffee bar in an Italian restaurant. Um, and I got a job over there, started baristing over there. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I, I, uh, I, I did it. Either, it was an, either an interview or a video recently where I described it like we weren't super into coffee. We were into the idea of coffee at the time, coffee shops, coffee drinks, um, like the Gilmore Girls. Um, it's kind of how, like, I, I imagine that. Um, but so, like, I just started off, like, you know, I enjoyed cafes and coffee drinks. And we have both since learned a lot more about coffee. You know, I went into it career-wise. Um, so after college, I ended up 
you know, long story so short, Onyx was hiring and I wanted to move to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I ended up getting a job. I barista there for about a year, um, then moved into management and then moved into education. Uh, so, you know, I've got a background in teaching, a background in science, and I just enjoyed the culture still, except now I had something that also like satisfied that intellectual itch. And, you know, I love the, the community here in Northwest Arkansas. I love Onyx and, uh, you know, I've just, uh, just really enjoyed my time and growth here. That sounds amazing. And I mean, that sounds like what a lot of us do, which is kind of start doing coffee on the side, part-time hustle, you know, when mm -hmm. you're studying and you kind of go into full-time work. And what is one thing that you were doing when you were a baby barista that you would not be caught dead doing now where you are? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, wow. What was one thing I would do as a baby barista that I would not do now? Um, you know, like ooh, the well, knock knock tamp or the, you know, like I didn't anything do that. out there. I, I had absolutely horrid uh, tamping technique. It was like the knock knock tamp, <laughs> polish, more coffee, tamp as hard as you can. So my, my barista technique was, was really awful. Um, you know, to get more into like a, I guess like a technical or nerdy side of things. When I was first starting out, like doing pour overs at home and stuff, I had a really uh, low quality grinder. And I thought like, if I sifted out the fines with like a little sieve, uh, that, that would improve my cup. And it did. Uh, but like, I think I, I lasted a lot longer in this, like fines are bad, uh, like growth phase. And now I'm at a point, I think, you know, that I basically grind my coffee as finely as I can. <laughs> and that is the eternal debate, you know, the fine grind versus the coarse grind. But we will go into that in a second. That was part of the recipe that you used this year at the World Brewers Cup Championship. Um, tell us a little bit about how long you've been competing. You've been in the circuit for a while. I have been. Um... I was complaining to Tetsu that this was my fourth year of competition uh, and it only took him three years uh, before he, he won. And so now I am absolutely old news. Um, but yeah, this was my fourth year of competition. Um, I won US in 2020 for the first time. It was my, my first time in any finals as well. Um, and, you know, since then it has, the competition circuit has been really great to me. Uh, but yeah, this was my fourth, fourth season, fourth season in a row, even so. And what draws you to the Brewers Cup? I, I kind of feel like there's a, not so much a stereotype, but the, it, different competitions attract different groups of people. And what is it that attracts you to, you know, to Brewers? I like the, I like that question and like what specifically draws me to Brewers. Um, I mean, most of it is because I enjoy filtered coffee more than I do espresso. And I enjoy the amount of freedom you have in the Brewer's Cup. And I also enjoy the compulsory portion of the Brewer's Cup. Um, to me, it's the, you know, there's things we can, we could knock about the, the circuit or any, any competition. But like, I think the Brewer's Cup is like the purest of them. Like you have this this level ground and compulsory, and then you have this showcase portion in the open service. And you know, I'm a pretty competitive person. It sports all through high school and college, and then have still competed in as an adult, which um, causes me a great great bodily harm sometimes. <laughs> uh, but you know, I I did it at first to kind of establish myself in the industry, kind of. And especially to learn a lot of things, I think competition takes a combination of not only confidence, but humility, like the understanding that there are people that know not only different things, but more than you and that you can learn from those things. But I also think if you're going to get on stage, you should have the confidence that what you're doing is the best. <laughs> because how can you convince the judges that your cup is the best if you don't even believe it? 
Exactly. No, that's true. And I think it's it's so hard. And I, I see what you're saying about compulsory. So for those of you that don't know, uh, this year was my first Brewers Cup as well. And I got, you know, the absolute privilege of competing alongside Lika this year. And what I found was, yeah, compulsory is such a great leveler of, you know, of the competition. You kind of, everyone's on, everyone's on an equal footing and that's amazing. But then you also get to showcase a coffee that you love and are so connected to. And for you this year, it was the blend of the Immaculata Sudan Rume and Eugenoides. Yeah, yeah. Are you wanting me to, to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> tell us a bit more because obviously Immaculata is one of the, you know, one of the best farms in the world with this incredibly um, nuanced coffee that is in such short supply and you were able to kind of take that onto the world stage. So how was that for you? Yeah, that was that was a great experience. Um, Eugenoides, Immaculata has been on the world stage before, you know, with their Sudan Rame even you know, back in 2015, um, at least like super elevated. And obviously, um, you know, we both know this guy named Matt Winton who used, I think some, some eugenoides at, or something. Um, but yeah, it's been great to work with Immaculata over the years. I was first introduced to Immaculata. Um, I think it was 2018 um, from Isaiah Sheese over at Archetype Coffee. He used uh, the Eugenoides in his uh, US barista uh, routine. Um, and they're friends, um, Isaiah's a friend, and I got to try it, try it then for the first time. Um, and then after that, as Onyx's relationship with Immaculata grew, especially through their Lorena and Geisha, um, they just, so, you know, what they're known for is growing these, these rare varietals and species of coffee and, especially this over the past year of working with them, like I've just been amazed by their commitment to the sustainability, not only of their farms, but also of their, their workers. They have full-time staff fully paid with benefits year round. And so they, you know, are constantly harvesting fly crop um, so that they can keep a, a staff of, of harvesters on, you know, full-time. Um, and that to me is really cool, which, yeah, they're really hard to get right now. They had a 76% loss in not only eugenoides, but they had like, you know, three years ago, 100% loss of Lorena. And so they're only now about to to have their first harvest of, you know, fresh planted Lorena. And, but because they have like such a diverse portfolio of really high quality they can weather this storm of, you know, having a loss. Um, it just makes it really, really hard to get. <laughs> and that is certainly an understatement, but I'm sure that you made a delicious cup of coffee. I got to taste it backstage. It was amazing. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about where your head was at backstage i think we were all just kind of very focused on what we were doing at the time and just didn't really have time to check in with each other you know during competition so what you know what were some of the challenges that you feel we faced this year um in the brewers cup Ooh. i mean this is only my second time there <laughs> so uh see I, it's hard to see like trends i guess um, but some of the challenges that I think we, we see at, or at least saw in Melbourne, um, you know, there's always some sort of change. So we had a change in format from last year's compulsory. Um, you know, that's not a historical change. It's always been an option, but it's, it's a lot different than what most national competitions do for compulsory. So I think that was a big change for people. I mean, it was a big change. I've never done that that format before. Um, and I think it it was a little bit more overwhelming this year than Milan was. There was a lot more, because this was especially Coffee Expo and not just a, like a restaurant trade show. There was a lot larger specialty coffee community um, in Melbourne. And while that was really fun, it was also really difficult to like not only want to talk to everybody 
but have people want to talk to you while you're trying to like be in the zone and like sort over over sort your coffee beans or like run through your script at a wall <laughs> So there is this thing that I've come to learn is called the comp brain. So when people <laughs> are in competition mode, they have the comp brain on. What's something that you've done with your full comp brain on that you look back and you're like, oh crap, I probably should have done that or I should have said that. Or like, what are some silly things you've done? Oh, well, I am one to, to pace around and talk with my hands. Um, And I really get in the zone where, so like, I'm a tall guy, as, as you know, I'm, I'm six, four. And what happens when I get like in the zone is I lose everything like in my lower peripherals. And so like, I'll bump into things, I'll bump into people. Um, so that's why you've ignored me so many times. <laughs> <laughs> Now I get it. You just blanked me. For reference, yeah. I'm like five foot, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, anything anything under five five is just a table or a chair to me. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, speaking of Milan, that was actually where I met you last year, and I again had the amazing privilege of emceeing you and getting to see you on the final stage for you know for the first time. Um, how was it different this year? having made it to finals versus last year, were there any big differences in, in kind of how you were feeling or were you just like, Oh yeah, great. You know, done it again. Or was it like a, Whoa, this is, you know, this is big, <laughs> this is bigger. It, like I said, I'm a competitive person and I want to win things. So last year in Milan, even though like I wanted to win, I didn't know what it, took to win at the world stage you know it had even been uh at, at least four years i forget off the top of my head since a u.s competitor had been in the finals of the world brewers cup um and so even like my friends recently you know from uh from kaylee gann and dylan siemens who, who had competed recently at um at worlds like we also hadn't seen success So we didn't know what it looked like. Um, and so making finals in Milan was like one of the most exciting experiences, like especially with um, with my boss, Andrea, making finals in Barista. Like like the excitement level there was like when, when we won US, like it was so exciting and so much fun for the team. Um, and then, you know, probably because I'm I'm so competitive, like, I felt like I had a really good understanding of competition. And so I, you know, not to be that guy, but like I expected to make finals and to not do that would have been a disappointment to me. Um, and so it felt more pressure until my name was called <laughs> than I did last year. Like, absolutely. But like once that name was called, it's still so exciting um, and confirming to, to, be consistently successful um but yeah it felt like a lot of pressure just standing up there <laughs> i bet no like and you say that you're a competitive person you've always been a competitive person by nature you know but is competition just for people who are competitive like why would you encourage someone else to compete at all you know and i'm sure you've had many of these conversations and you know in the time that you've been back and the time that you've been champion Why would you encourage someone to compete? I I love that question because, yeah, it's not just because we don't compete just because we want to win. Like, what's the point in that? Like, that's not fun. <laughs> um, I would encourage anybody to compete who either wants to grow in their skills because at any level of competition, you have to put in some level of effort, which means you have to put what you're doing under some level of scrutiny and like there's things we do in the cafe that we've reassessed through learning things in competition it's like oh let's take a look at every single thing we're doing and ask ourselves does it bring a benefit like what is it more efficient and does it improve quality and if it improves quality is it efficient um So anybody who wants to improve in their skills, 
learn new things or has something to share. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is a platform. It is a competition. And so there's certain restrictions to, you know, those things, but it's such a great tool for either confirming your barista skills or learning new barista skills. And like I said, like putting the things that you do under a microscope and seeing like, you know, almost like Marie Kondo style, like, does it bring joy? Does it improve quality? And is it efficient? Like, why do you do something behind the bar if it doesn't actually work? If it doesn't, let's throw it out. I love that comparison. That's <laughs> so great. No, absolutely. And I, again, like what you just said really resonated with me. Like, I don't think I've learned so much about brewing in like the how many, however many years I've been in coffee than I have in the last year. There's just such an insane learning curve, which is incredible. Um, so what else keeps you busy these days? So now that competition has wound down, you're back to your ordinary life. You know, what, what keeps you busy? I have a lot of things that keep me busy. Um, you know, we have five cafes here at Onyx. And so when I'm not managing the training department and trying to grow the training department, um, I have a few hobbies, I guess. Um, you know, I uh, I like to work out, run, play sports. Um, you know, that's how I broke broke my, my hand was playing a game of basketball. And I will just go ahead and throw this in there because it's a fun fact. It wasn't even like, it's not an exciting story. I didn't break it like dunking the basketball or something. It was the tip off of our first game of competitive city league. Um, you know, I know everybody wants to say, you know, oh, it's because, you know, I made a bad cup for Sierra and she smacked it out of my hand so hard. Um, but yeah, I like sports. Um, I enjoy books and movies and, um, I like uh, liquid culture, so not just visiting cafes, but uh, I enjoy um, wines and, and spirits. Um, I don't know. I just like fun stuff. <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, yeah, you like you broke your hand a while ago, actually, and we, we caught up in Milan earlier this year when that happened. And I was so hoping that you were going to brew with like your left hand at the world or something. And I was like, great, Alika has a handicap. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, unfortunately, you still totally smashed it. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> and you actually, can see in the pictures, though, I have it's, it was very swollen in finals. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, and actually one question I wanted to pick your brain about, forget drinking the world's best coffee, you know, Sudan, Rume, Eugenoides, what's been just a regular, you know, drinkable coffee that you've come back to and you're like, oh my gosh, I uh, something I can drink oh my gosh, that I just enjoy as an everyday brew. What What's that been for you? That is Onyx's house blend, Southern weather. It's a 50-50 blend of a washed Colombia um, and usually a washed uh, Ethiopia. And it's just like, it's the best house blend of the world. Uh, Dakota and I brewed that up uh, almost every morning uh, in, in Melbourne and uh, shared it with some competitors too. That was really funny. Uh, I told Tetsu that was my, my competition brew. <laughs> oh man, I wish I could have tasted it. Um... <laughs> Right, so we're going to go very quickly into the picture section of this interview. Um, we have a photo of you right here. And I would love for you to explain this photograph, please. <laughs> you look okay. very serious. I was so very serious. Um, yeah, so in 2017, uh, I competed in cup tasters and qualifiers in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I was uh, a baby barista here. Um, I was managing uh, our Springdale Cafe at the time. And I did not very well at cup tasters. So um, it was a blur. Like I worked really hard hard like I got a ton of coffee from a ton of different roasters you know I brew them and have baristas mixing them up for me and I was in a trance until I got to cup 
uh, four uh, from the, the table of six where I was like, I don't remember anything I just did. <laughs> well, you're going to love this. And I don't know if I've ever told you this, actually, but I also did cup tasters way back in the day once, once ever, and got DQ'd. Oh, no. <laughs> and that was because I didn't read the rules. So for anybody wanting to compete, read the rules. I basically I... placed the lid. You're going to love this. I placed the lid of my bottle. They gave us like sponsored bottles at the time as part mm -hmm. of the track. And in my head, it was like, well, why don't we have a rinsing bowl? Because all cuppings have a rinsing bowl. So I took the lid off, put some water in there, put it on the table, rinsed my spoon i scored seven out of eight for that round but i got disqualified immediately after so we Dang. have matching bad cup taster stories we do i got three out of six in not a super fast time um although i i did get my last three were the ones correct to work i my first three it was like i don't remember what i just did It was like, you drink coffee every day, just drink coffee. And so then I like got back in the zone for, for cups. Uh, well, I guess four, five and six, but golly, it's seven out of eight. If only they'd let us rinse our spoons. I know. I know. Well, WCC, you heard it here first. Um, actually, that does bring this last question to mind, which is, would you compete in any other competition now would you give Brewers cup another chance you know strike for gold or you know do you think it's time to strike out for something new entirely well what are your thoughts that's i think on every question i say that's a good question and it's not always because i'm stalling to try to figure out a better answer for it um i don't know i've not officially decided if i'm going to um try again this year Um, I do already have some some coaching commitments, um, not like official coaching. You know, there's some people I'm going to help out. Um, but additionally, like I'll be uh, volunteering for uh, Glitter Cat Barista, uh, their Brewers Cup boot camp um, over in California um, early next month. So like competition wise, I think if I can, if I decide that there is something that I uh, can still bring to the table for, for Brewers Cup, that's um that i would consider it again i think my consolation is that sherry was technically a finalist uh previously so it's like she's technically had more experience than me um uh so but yeah otherwise i really love sigs and sigs is a much bigger competition outside of the u.s um and you know this this past year was the first u.s competitor we've we've submitted in sigs Um, so it's still like a growing competition, which I think is really interesting. It's like a, like to be able to like hop into something that's not as established, you know, there's no trends in us SIGs because we've done it twice. <laughs> so I think that sounds like fun. I haven't gotten bit by the barista bug yet. We have, um, you know, there's a ton of great competitors in the U S um, and I, you know, maybe someday, but But definitely not right now. <laughs> That's entirely fair. And speaking of SIGs and barista comps, we are going to take a quick look at Alika's signature beverage video now. So make sure you check this out and we will be right back with a few more questions. Hey everybody, it's Alika Lifty. Hey everybody, uh, two time U.S. Brewers Cup champion and two-time World Brewers Cup finalist. That's really impressive. Whoa. I have got a fun little mocktail build today. This is going to be a riff on a uh, pineapple punch. I am really great at naming specialty bread beverages. So here I bring you the espresso pineapple punch. We're going to need a few uh, specific ingredients, namely pineapple juice. Fresh squeezed is always going to be best, um, but if you can find one not from concentrate, that is also going to be top notch. We are going to need some ginger beer. I recommend the spicier the better. You do want sweetness, um, so not one of those botanicals, botanical ones you want, um, like an actual ginger beer, not ginger ale. Like I said, you want that spice. Um, and 
Uh, this is a drink traditionally made with a dark rum, and I wanted to keep this non-alcoholic, so I have made a, uh, like a rum concentrate almost. I have taken uh, some 100% date syrup and cooked it down with cinnamon, clove, allspice, and uh, Sichuan peppercorns, as well as pink peppercorns and whole vanilla bean. So I cooked this down for a while. Um, the, you know, the spices are helping to mimic the dark rum. The date syrup obviously is helping to mimic uh, the dark rum. And the Sichuan peppercorns are just giving you this nice like tingle. Um, yeah, I was really happy with how this turned out. Um, it, this is my proprietary recipe. Uh, proprietary only because I did not measure any of the ingredients. Um, so I don't know what amount of everything I put in here. So some sort of all those things and you'll be probably good to go. Um, I also want a lemon and uh, some orange blossom water with Angostura bitters. I know Angostura bitters are technically alcoholic, so you can omit that if you like. It'll still be nice with the uh, orange blossom. Um, all right, and I like to combine this with a coffee that is tropical, but also kind of um, herbal or floral um, or even botanical. So uh, Katukai, you could get away with like a SL34, SL28, um, and I'm gonna brew the coffee that I used in competition is gonna be Sudan Rumay. So first I want a quarter ounce of my dark rum syrup. And I'm gonna pull my shot directly onto this so that I get nice, some nice dissolving action. And I'm gonna pull a pretty tight shot. Uh, this is gonna be 20 grams in and I'm only pulling um, about 40 mils out. Like I said, I like this Sudan Rame because it itself is pretty tropical, but it has this really nice herbaceous quality to it, floral character to it, that complements both the pineapple juice in the punch as well as the ginger beer in the punch. Honestly, because we have so much sweetness coming from both the date syrup and the pineapple juice, you could opt for under extracting a coffee to get a little bit more salinity to it. This will add nice complexity. Um, on the other side of things, if you find that your ginger beer is not as spicy in the character, you can extract more of this coffee to help get a little bit more bitterness uh, and botanical qualities to it. All right, we're gonna let our shot sit for a moment, let it cool, let this um, syrup dissolve, and uh, let's build our drink. So, got my shot. It's mixed up rather nicely, and I need a highball glass with some ice. Cool our beverage off. And first, let's add two and a half ounces of our ginger beer. This is not a big deal if you make it a little bit flat. It's such a small percentage of our drink anyway that you're not gonna get much of that sparkling effect. So don't worry about making it flat. So two and a half ounces, uh, oop, that was only two. There we go, the extra half. Two and a half ounces of ginger beer. I need two ounces of pineapple juice. Lovely, lovely. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a little mix. Next, let's do the same thing. Let's add our espresso. Now, if I was really cool, I'd be able to make this float. All right, so. We have everything in here, let's give it another mix. I wanna incorporate that, otherwise it's gonna be quite spicy there on the front. Now, I'm gonna garnish this 
with two spritzes of my Orange Blossom and Angostura mix. And lemon peel. So the citrus, the Orange Blossom, the Ango, um, mixed with the pineapple juice and everything that's already in here make for a very complex nose to this drink. Very strong in pineapple. It becomes more tropical, like mango. Um, becomes very like cocoa and tea-like. It's a very nice drink. I'm gonna drink it. That's delicious. Hey. I always say this, but serve and enjoy. Well, probably not after you drink it, but you get the idea. That was super cool, Alika. Do you want to explain your drink to us a little bit more? I would love to. So it was a um, riff on a pineapple punch. So, I mean, what where I approached it is I, I wanted to make a, a tiki drink, but with coffee and I wanted it to be in a, um, so in the place of rum, I used espresso and, you know, that cooks uh, date syrup. Um, so I really love that beverage. It was a little polarizing. Um, there was a lot of people who really loved it because it's a little spicy, it's a little herbaceous, um, but it was really sweet and very uh, pineapple forward, not only because of the coffee, but the pineapple juice, the pineapple punch. Um, some people thought it was um, just a little bit too complex, um, but I thought it was really good. And so did John Allen, and he's my boss. So he doesn't have to tell me when things don't taste good, or he does have to tell me when things don't taste good. <laughs> no, absolutely. I wish I could taste it. A tiki drink sounds great right now. Um, well, you're gonna have to make it for me next time because that is it for us for this interview, unfortunately. Thank you very much again, Alika, our 2021 and 2022 World Brewers Cup Championship finalists. And thank you so much to our sponsors once again, Brewers to Attitude, our season sponsor, and Scotsman Ice, our product sponsor. So we're going to be back next week interviewing another all-star and checking out their signature beverage. So goodbye from me and Alika. Goodbye. Ciao, Bob. <laughs>